to Margaret Hemsley. Mm -hmm. Margaret, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Simon. Lovely to catch up and have a chat with you guys as well. Been a while. Thanks for joining us, Margaret. We've only we've only just met tonight, although I do remember you from years ago. And uh, thanks so much again, as Simon said, for your time. And uh, super keen to hear your your story. I think we might need to uh, relabel the podcast the ACT Cycling Chronicles because everyone's from the bloody ACT, which is great. So really, well, they've been here at some stage. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But look, I, I can't um, say enough uh, to you, Margaret, and to all our guests. Uh, it's just been a wonderful uh, journey for Paul and I over the last three months, and we really appreciate the opportunity to sit down and talk about your career. Um, you know, we've, we've spoken to people like Olivia Gollum, um, Tracy Gaudry, and now it's your turn. Uh, you know, you were uh, one of the, the female cyclists who was really uh, at the forefront of of, uh, of cyclists from Australia going overseas. And before we get to that, can you can you tell us, this is probably my favourite question for all our interviews, can you tell us about the first time you, were, you rode a bike, both both for fun and in anger? Uh, so I learned how to ride a bike when I was six and my dad found a bike at our local garbage dump and put it together. Awesome. And he just rolled me down the driveway. Oh, that's a great story. So training wheels, no training wheels. No, I don't. Do they even have training wheels in the early seventies? No. <laughs> I certainly didn't. They didn't have them at the dump anyway. Where Dad found the bike. Awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I rode a little bit of a, a bike as a kid, but probably not very much. And I, when I went to university, I took up. So I was a hockey player. So field hockey is my sport. Played that for thirty plus years. What position? Uh, inside forward. That's a good position. Yep. I like to run. And when I moved to university, I joined the running club up at University of Queensland. And I was like a relatively decent runner. Like, I don't know, came third in the uh, Brisbane half marathon, sort of fifth in the state cross country. What? Decent. Not amazing, but. What, what was the half marathon PB? The 79.10. Oh. A long time ago. Wow, that's awesome. So, and then of course, what happens is you get injured. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. And so then I ran into um, a guy named Jeremy Mayer, who worked, who owned the university bike shop, and his wife was Liz Heppel, who oh. was really one of the trailblazing cyclists. Yeah. Actually, she would be very, she and Donna Ray Zlinky would be very interesting to interview because they really. God, the racing that they did back in the day, in the 80s, would be quite a story. She did um, Ironman stuff too, did she not? Yeah, yeah, triathlon. So yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I'll get first for years. So I eventually got on a bike. I did some triathlons, got on a bike, mostly triathlons to start with. I did race a bit with the University of Queensland where I met Kim Shirley, who's Matt Heyman's wife. So I've known Kim Shirley longer than I've known Greg and, I've and longer than I've known Matt. So... We raced together as in our mid mid twenties. So really, I mean, I didn't uh, would have been twenty three before I even got on a mountain bike. What? So what year was that? Uh, ninety four. Wow. So you you got injured from running and you what, you backed off on the cycling and went jumped on a bike. Yeah, backed off. Yeah, and then started swimming as well and did some triathlons and I was like a decent age group triathlete and then. Um, when I finished university, I moved to, I got a job in Newcastle. Didn't know yep. anyone. <laughs> um, but I did have a friend that I played hockey with and she said, oh, I'm moving to Singleton. I said, great, we'll catch up. Haven't seen her since. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, and I worked in a little practice in Mayfield when I first got there. And I met a woman named, um, and I thought I'm going to be the best triathlete in Newcastle. It'll be fabulous. But. Um, this Scottish girl named Stephanie Forrester moved to Newcastle at exactly the same time. Yeah, and she Stephanie? swam at Newcastle Uni, yeah. Yeah, and she was a gun. She sort of ran similar or a little bit quicker than me, didn't ride as well as I did, but she was a swimmer as a kid. Yeah. So she didn't beat me by much, but she beat me in the Newcastle triathlon and I was devastated. But we then became really good friends. So Awesome. And then... Um, 
Is this the Newcastle Triathlon on the foreshore or is this another yeah. one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the old foreshore triathlon. Yeah. Um, and then I started doing a bit more riding because for bike skills and all those kind of things. And so I used to do the bunch with the Hadleys on a Saturday morning. Yeah. Basically a coffee ride bunch. Yeah. And, you know, a little bit more with um, Rob and the crew and all that. So I hadn't, by then, I hadn't had anything to do with any of the real cyclists like the Greggs we bear back in the day and the Chapos and the, all those guys hadn't yeah. been with them. And um, I got a stress fracture in my femur and I said, right, I'm going to bike race. So this was 1996, halfway through. And Rob Hadley said to me, oh, look, I don't really have time to coach. I'm pretty busy, but I've got this young guy in the bike shop who's just done his level one cycling coaching course. And, yeah. um, and then I went into the bike shop and he had red hair. And a red laser, <laughs> and a red Ford laser as well. So it wasn't love at first sight. No, no. <laughs> but he was pretty fit back in the day. He was pretty handsome, the old Greg Dora. I remember, I remember um, when we did a like. Ah, oh, do you remember Ian Jones? Yep. So he's now works at Penfolds Winery. He's like really high up. Wow. Um, yeah, and he did. He was doing um, sports science. At University of Queensland, and it took as long to do a VO2 max test. And I remember Greg being devastated because he was 90 kilos. Oh, he's a bit more than that now. <laughs> <laughs> I say we've been married uh, 20 years and 40 kilos. <laughs> wow. <laughs> We're going to have to get Greg on so he can defend himself. But absolutely, he'll blame me. It's all my fault. Uh, that's all. Awesome. So, what was it like when he first started training you? Did he give you efforts? Did he give you long rides? Did he get you racing? Lots of efforts and and riding with the fellas as well. So, I remember having to do turns on the front of that bloody bunch up Charlestown Road until my heart rate was about one hundred and well, two hundred probably, and um, and it was always a joy to drop a few of the fellas off the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, good. There you go. Wow. Who, and then was some of the, who were some of the names that, at that stage? Well, Greg was still racing then, so. Uh, oh, Boxhead? Yeah. Yeah, McGrath, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Chappie was, was still racing then. Scott yep. Farley? Yeah, Scott yeah. Scott Farley, yep. Um, oh, Dave God. Newton. Dave Newton was still around. Yeah, yeah. I mean, David Wells used to. Lovell. Oh, Lovell. yeah. Still going. He's 140. <laughs> Hi, Ann. <laughs> he, he even visited us um, in Germany one year. He's a great guy. Lovely he's guy. Avid, he's an well, avid listener, so. He's been around forever. And you know what? Clubs don't run without guys like Ian. No, I agree. So well, you were racing A-grade at Kura Gang for the, on the Friday nights and the Saturdays and stuff at that stage back in 95, 94, 95? No, I, they wouldn't let me race um, A-grade. I was still racing B-grade. Oh, right. And um, Big Gav, do you remember Big Gav? Yeah, 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 Gav yeah. Vickers. He would, he would kill himself not to let me win B grade. Oh, would he? <laughs> <laughs> Big Gav. So Great. whenever I was off the front, he was he was on the front of the bunch chasing me down. Right in but, but obviously something so, tweaked for you though, because you just kept going, and you've obviously found the level of enjoyment that you didn't with other pursuits. Oh, and also, look, what you learn from running. So I had a, a fabulous running coach at the University of Queensland is how to suffer, and I think it's actually a skill because, you know, a lot of people, it's one thing to have the physiology, it's also the ability to hurt yourself. And so I accelerated. My skills weren't quite there, but my physiology was great, so I accelerated quite quickly. Through, like I sort of, in, a, in 18 months, made the AIS team. So, you know, winning New South Wales titles in two years. Well, Liv did something similar, the same thing. You know, just if you train hard, it's not complicated. It's, it's What is it weird. about hurting yourself that you enjoy? I think it's afterwards. Mm. <laughs> it's not, yeah. I, I think, yeah, it does. I mean, I mean it, it does feel good afterwards. It doesn't feel good at the time. And you're always yeah. dreaded. But it's, yeah. it is. Um, awesome. Awesome. The only way to improve. Do you find when you ride now and you get to that moment where you think, oh, the pain's coming, you actually are still able to lock in to where you need to get to? Uh, I have to say I don't do a lot of hard riding these days, <laughs> I'll be honest, because I don't have it because of the four boys, I don't have a lot of time to go out 
with big bunches and stuff. So I tend to ride with a bunch of girls and we're and we're all got ba kids and we're all sort of 40 plus and it's mostly for enjoyment. Every now and again, I'll go out with a bunch and I'll have a go and I do end up feeling quite sick because I think when you don't have that <laughs> the old base when you have a real hit out and the temptation is always there. Cause you're you're always. I, yeah, I do. If I pin a number on, then I have to go hard, but I'd rather not pin a number on. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I, you can probably never take it away that, you know, you're obviously a competitive person. I think anyone who does this stuff always is, and it, it never goes away, does it? Can we can we sort of go back a couple of steps? You, you know, that was a pretty quick window to jump to win state titles after 18 months. Um, what was your first big major win? What was that state title? Um... I think it was just a new South. Oh, yeah, well, probably. What do they call it? The uh, the country titles. I think that was probably my first win. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe in 1997. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. Awesome. So, and so, how did it progress from there? So, um, so Greg coached me probably until um, we started going out. <laughs> but I fought that for a long time. It's <laughs> You don't want to go out with your coach because that's not very cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, and when that happened, then I shifted over and Mick Chapman coached me. Oh, right. And he's the king of suffering. Oh, wow. Oh, there were some time trial efforts and lactates and he he loved that science stuff, Mick. Sugar was, life. What about, did you ever go up to Gloucester, to Nounda? No, I really probably only had a couple of years in Newcastle doing that training so the time and I was working full time so the time to do that kind of stuff just yeah. wasn't there there was just there were lots of sugar loaves lots of cut ca um card of roads and yeah. and Greg's, Greg also had a really big thing for doing um brown street reps oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Brown Street for anyone who doesn't live in Newcastle what, what's it graded at 20 percent or 18 percent or something more than that I reckon cool. 22 or something I don't pretty know bad. it's pretty horrible yeah and, and what is it 200 meters 150 oh, feels like 20 is. kilometers when you're doing it yeah yeah that's that was Greg's you can ask Liv about that too that was Greg's favorite thing to do all those really short steep hills around Newcastle in town like just sprinting up those as hard as you can go and then doing it again and doing the next one and doing that again wow, wow. that's amazing and yeah, so then from from Mick, then I made the N Swiss. But Mick was still coaching me when I was with N Swiss, and because it was too hard to travel to Sydney and do all of Sato's stuff, so we'd do some training camps with them. And because I'm from Canberra, so I grew up in Canberra, went to University of Queensland, and then moved back to Newcastle. Um, when I finished working in Newcastle, I uh, and travelled with AIS. So I went away with the AIS first in 1999, and then when I came back, I was living in Canberra because I didn't have any money. <laughs> and right. so then Gary Sutton said to um, Warren McDonald, "I think we'll just call her Actas." So then I went across to Actas. So when yeah. you were with the AIS and when you went over, so N-Swiss AIS, did you have an income or what did they pay you or how did you survive or did you just get free food and lodging? or? Yeah, yeah, free food and lodging and um, pocket money. Wow, so how did you survive? Uh, come back and work and save. Wow. How much has it progressed? I mean, there's a several teams now and I know certainly in the triathlon world, prize money is almost equal now at, at major races. I think cycling's the same yet. But it's no, it's not the same, but it is. there is talk of different teams trying to balance out the pay. You know, how did you survive? That's crazy. Incredible. Uh, yeah, look, the first, look, it, it is, because the first year I only went across for three months. So you sort of take three months leave without pay and then you get another job. So I would take a few physio. I mean, I had a degree. So I would take physiotherapy jobs. I worked um, in Newcastle at Lingard. Sports oh, yeah. Medicine Centre, yep, and then at the hospital there, and then when I went back to 
Canberra, I worked at our local Calvary Hospital and worked out at a practice in Queanbeyan, so to save money. And then um, when I went professional with Nuremberg, um, Greg and I went together. So it was actually, I could have been put in a team house. And so you can survive because the team pays mm. your accommodation. So I'd, with Farm Fritz, actually, I was in a team house in uh, in um, Rotterdam in Holland. So yeah. my first year. And look, that was fun, but also hard living with people that you race with all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so you could survive financially, but there wasn't, you know, there was no clothes shopping or anything other than that. So <laughs> what, what was it that kept you there then? Because it sounds like an incredible challenge to go there. You're living very frugally. You're, you know, literally uh, flogging yourself. Well, Greg got a job in Germany. Right. So, so he and I sort of did it together. And we had really an amazing life. So I raced uh, for a, three years with the German team, Nuremberger, who ended up having a lot of, a lot of Australians over the years. Mm -hmm. And... I lived 20 kilometres from the team director, so I'd go riding with him. So I went riding with some of the German. He was friends with a guy named Kai Hundertmark. And so I'd do some training with him where we lived and also Danilo Hondo. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. yep, so a couple of rides. And because I, I, I learned German, coincidentally, I learned German at school. So then I could speak German to them as well. So I was a bit of an anomaly. He's an Australian wow. girl, could speak German and... Um, you know, we were, Greg, Greg would work on the bikes with the teams. He got a job, an IT job in Germany, and but he would spend the weekends coming to bike races and working for nothing, which is probably where the few kilos came on, drinking beers and eating bratwurst. <laughs> oh, bugger. Give him a break. <laughs> so what was it like, those, those, that sort of transition from the end Swiss, so, so Kura Gang, you know, club races to end Swiss to AIS to you know, riding in Europe, was it like just really, you know, quite different each time you got on the bike in those races? Uh, yeah, and it was really hard. Like I I almost, I almost did it too fast and I didn't have, like I'll be honest, I didn't have the skills when I started there. I still remember James Victor saying to me, get those green nicks off the back of the bunch. Like, you know, in Australia you race with 20 girls and then you go to Europe and you're with 160. Wow. On wow. a little tiny row. Yeah, and also when you do it at, Oh, it was 1999, I was 27, 28, when I first went over to um, Europe and I just had no idea. So I I had the physio, like if we had a time trial, I'd be up there relatively. Yeah, yeah. I, I could get sort of even top 10s, top 15s in some of the time trials. But um, in the road races, when you start, I mean, you guys know, you start if you start a hundredth wheel going up a hill, it doesn't matter how fast you go up the hill, you're going to be dead by the time. And if yeah. you get every single descent, then you're never, never going anywhere. So my first season, I raced, I was there three months and I raced 56 races. Oh. I broke two collarbones oh. <laughs> and I crashed in every race except the last race I went in. Holy crap. Well done. Yep. You mean, well done, Don't take this the wrong way, but you really are a triathlete. <laughs> yeah, break both on I am side. as well. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> no. you break both on either side or just the same one? Uh, both sides. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah. I'd like to ask a, a question. Was, was there a moment when, you know, that first pro contract, you know, you've gone from, say, state titles in New South Wales or the ACT when you landed that first pro contract, that that's all of our dreams that, you know, you've got to live to a degree. Um, did that really dawn on you when you got over there or was it here or when you lined up for your first race in Europe? It's pretty cool because I raced with a team called Farm Fritz and Leontine Van Morsel was our, Zylard, was our team leader. She's and that was one person. of the last years that she raced. Wow. She won everything, didn't she? Like literally. Yeah, yeah, amazing. And so, and also racing in Holland is, uh, I learned a lot. So 99 was my first year. 2000, I came back and was much fitter and I, I won the um, Oceana title at the mm. end of 1999. And so that qualified me automatically a spot for Worlds in 2000. Um, so, but... 
just much more competitive and I could get to the front of the bunch. And once you people see you there, they let you in as well. So, yeah. it's a, you know, you have to earn a little bit of respect. Um, wasn't really, you know, setting the world on fire, but gradually just improving and over that year. And also that summer in Australia, I trained with AIS and I trained with Matt Hayman and Rory Sutherland and um, James Medley. And there was like this amazing bunch of guys and we were doing 800 Ks a week. Mm. Also. So Ali um, Wright and I, or Ali McGovern now, and this gr- great big group of men and pro men and boys. And we super just, strong. Yeah, we just had this amazing summer. And then I went from being one of the weaker riders because my first season, James, because I was older than everyone else, he sent me to do the Tour de France with um, Nuremberger, as it turns out. And so I went from <laughs> doing little races in Italy and a few other races to doing the Tour de France, which back in those days was a nightmare. I think we How raced. many stages was it back then? 16. Wow. Yeah, or, or 15 and 1,600 kilometres. But we'd do things like 20 kilometres of neutral up a hill. <laughs> like it was just, and we, we would drive for five hours on a mountain and get to a hotel at midnight and there'd be no food. We'd have eaten bread rolls and have to get up at 8 o'clock in the morning and descend down the mountain to get to the start. It was crazy. And that was with the people that I didn't even know in a foreign language. <laughs> wow. And then to, I guess, you know, next year is the, the return of... The, the tour de feminine or whatever they're calling it yep. and it's probably going back to those sorts of days i guess which is great to see because they're trying to follow the men's race aren't they to a little to yeah, a yeah. it's too it's too hard because we're not racing i mean i think even some of the men's the 260 k's is just crazy i think some of the stages are 150 maybe even 180 something like that but the girls yeah yeah, yeah. No, but yep. the boys, they'll be racing 250 on the Oh, side. mental. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what did you think of the Paris-Roubaix this year, the women's Paris-Roubaix? I saw a lot of it. I thought it was some of the most impressive cycling and the skills and handling, which is out of this world. Um, Crazy. Crazy. Yeah. So I've done a couple of races in hot, like Ronda van Drenta, um, that was, like, nice and cobbly, but not like, not like that because it was also wet as well. Just yeah. crazy. And actually, I had I've got a I had a friend staying with me, Naomi Williams, Ren, Ren. Oh yeah. She's like she was going, oh wow, that was my dream to race that. Like she just that would, would have been so her bag. And I was like, yeah, not into cobblestones in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone romances about it, but we did ask Matt about that there a couple of weeks ago about the reality of it, and I think the reality of it would scare a lot of people. Oh, cool. it's called the hell of the West for a reason, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would have done it, but I wouldn't have been begging to do it. <laughs> yeah, wow. Well. When you hear about the crashes and the injuries and the, like, it's almost um, luck when you get get through it, you know, like yeah. if you don't, if you get the right line and over the right cobbles, over the right wheel that you're on and, you know, obviously – Smart as well as like. So, so you guys on. When, when you were riding and on your journey and you're learning about the sort of cyclist you are, and we asked Rory this question, you know, he went from aspirations of being a team leader and being GC, but then over time he found his role as the domestic. And before we started tonight, you were talking about your own role as, as a domestic, but obviously you're very capable on, on time trials. How did you balance out what your role was and where your skill set and ability lay? Um, that's really decided by the team. Right. You know, like you, but, you know, all the teams will give you a chance if there's a race that will suit you. And so, you know, with my Nuremberger team, we would race smaller races and they'd be like, okay, you're the team leader, we're resting our GC riders. Um, you win this. And so, you know, you'd go to uh, like a German race and that would be your race to win. So I would win races over there. But when it came to doing, you know, the Women's Tour de France, then Judith Arndt would have been our team leader and then you'd just get on the front for her. Wow. And actually it, it's, you know, you just don't – and a lot of that too, I didn't watch a lot of cycling growing up. Like I was really late to it and I missed out on some of that education 
and it was very, you know, though I didn't have an easy time with um, Petra, uh, Rosna and Judith Art, what I learnt was amazing. Like I didn't quite learn it. I only had one year with Farm Fritz because I broke my hip and ended up in a Spanish hospital for a, a week and then two weeks in a German hospital because um, Greg had a health cover in Germany, so it was much cheaper to fly me back to Germany than back to Australia. Um, but, yeah, I didn't quite get the chance to learn those skills, but learn, underneath Judith and um, Petra, the skills that you learn as a domestic are amazing. You know, like mm. you don't think about it until you do it and maybe this comes automatically to you guys, but you actually don't want to, as a sprinting team, you don't want to catch the riders early, you know, mm. the bunch off the front. Mm. So you're not chasing them all out. You are chasing them just at the speed to catch them before the finish so no one else can attack, you know, like, and, you know, if you want to bring your lead rider up to the front, there's no point sprinting up there. You have to get them on the wheel and it's like a gradual, it's just, there's no, there was no, at that time in Australia, you just didn't learn those skills. So what's it like sitting on the front for a couple of hours, just you know, looking to get get the stage win? What's what? Do you, what goes through your head? Do you, are you thinking I actually about? I love that team stuff. Love it. That's right. You know, when there's three or four of you swapping off, because it's also not. It's hard, but it's not that. You know, it's not like a time trial where you are going to die. This is we are uh, working together for a common cause, and you know, Petra Rosner would say, "Okay, faster. Okay, slower. You're doing a great job." Or Nah, stop it. Stop being so rough. Or, you know, it, yeah, I really, I love that team stuff. I think a lot of people outside of cycling, you know, when the Tour de France comes around every year and someone in the office asks you about the tactics and stuff and you explain the role of a domestique and people don't quite understand it, but exactly what you've just described, some people love just being able to sacrifice themselves for the greater good, for the good of the team. And it's certainly an admirable trait for sure. Especially when you're slow. <laughs> you're obviously not, not too, too slow. slow. You've, got, you've got some nice results in your palm areas. What I mean is over 100 metres and not real quick. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to ask, during your, during your time with Nuremberg, you, you had a fairly decent Australian connection there, um, and I wanted to ask about the camaraderie that you had during that time. So the living, um, I, I was the only Australian at the time I was there. So oh, Liv, okay. the year I finished living and only then joined after that. Oh, bugger. I got that wrong. Sorry. No, that's right. But I, look, I had that with the German girls. And we would, you know, we would catch up at all the races, all the Aussie girls. We all got on really well. Yeah. It was exactly. always, you know, you do the big tours, didn't matter what team you were, you'd catch up for a coffee and all those things. I imagine the means would be, for the most part, the same. There's obviously, you don't love everyone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, Did you ever feel that? lonely over there? Being, how many other Australian females were there in the peloton when you were there? Oh, uh, there would have been 10 to 15. Oh, right, huh? Yep. Yeah, I don't think you'd feel super lonely. Yep. There was a whole bunch of us that went through together. So it was almost like a group retired or and then our group went through. So I was a lot older than them, but there was sort of certainly six to eight of us that started together. And a lot of us finished at the same time at the end of 2004. Yeah. Okay. So w when you were starting out, had you, you know, were you aware of people like Kathy Watt, um, people like Tracy uh, and others? Were you aware of the, the sort of the journey they'd been on as well? Or were you just, you know, so into your own path? And the no, we, just... we really, we did. There was a lot of awareness of that. Like, you know, I did a lot of domestic racing against Kathy because, she was sort of stayed in Australia for some of her mm. racing. Um, so we, she and I had for a couple of years a bit of a thing going on. She's a little bit quicker than me at the at the finish of a race, but we'd often be like one toing each other in yeah. a lot of races. And I look, I had a bit of an advantage because I was racing with N Swiss, so I had a bit of a team, more of a team, mm. and she was sort of on her own. But she was super strong. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned you mentioned earlier too that when you go to races and you get a bit of a status, people get out of the way or they move you up or they you know shift you around. Some of the riders you rode with uh, Van uh, Van Morsel um, and Judith Arndt and others, it, do they do they get you know that aura around them and people sort of back off a bit more and that actually gives them an extra say a couple of percent whatever it is because people are kind of a bit nervous around them or are they are people still quite aggressive or what, what's what's your sense in those 
in that um, race environment? They would definitely have respect, but the way they race is different. Like you just aren't um, super smart. Like I, I would love to have had a couple more seasons to watch and learn from her. So things like she would never kill herself over a hill. She, you know, if say mm -hmm. say it was a circuit course, if you watched her race, she would get to the front of the bottom of the hill and just go just as hard as she needed to, mm, to be mm. on the back of the front group, like every lap until until the final lap, and then she'd be as fresh as she could possibly be. Yeah. Mm. You know, and whereas I'm like, oh, I've got to be the front, I've got to be the front. <laughs> you know, like just never got to the level that I could be calm enough that I could relax and do that. Yeah. And you burn so much energy. Like the way she conserved energy, I guess that's the way to describe it so that she had it at the end it was always amazing if you're starting out again would you tell yourself anything different uh you know would you tell your younger say 20 year old self anything different about your career and about what you managed to achieve i would love to have ridden a bike as a kid i reckon you just got to mm. ride as a kid mm. it just i think it, as yeah and also i uh, you know a generalization but i think as you get older too you get more aware of the damage you can do to yourself so then you become it's like counterproductive you get more nervous and then you're more likely to crash but if you just you know the skills you have as a kid and you just don't lose them and they make all the difference yeah yeah what what would you rate as your greatest result national champion in 2002 if i'm correct i think that that would be definitely that must have been awesome my greatest loss <laughs> Would have been the Commonwealth Games <laughs> in 2002 also. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I saw on. that and I, I genuinely and I was heartfelt sympathy for you on that day. It's just an easy enough thing to happen to anyone, all of us. Yeah, and I think... Yeah. Describe to us what, what happened for those who don't know. <laughs> Sorry? What happened? What's the story? I it was it was wet and it was off camber, but my guess is I'm going to win this. I'm going to win this. I'm going too fast on this corner and just got a hand too much of a handful of the break on an off camber wet corner. Because you had like a minute a minute and a half lead, I think at the time. Yeah, I'm not sure, but the way the tactics would have worked, then I would have. It, it was still 14 k's to go, but just because of the team dynamic, it would have been difficult for them to catch me. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Did you did you like spend any time thinking about that? Did you have any lament? Did you go to any sort of conversations with anyone to help you get over that moment? Um. Oh, look. What can you do? I mean, that's nothing. Like, really, yeah. It's and life, but yeah. It's a sliding door moment. Like it was. It was. You know, Greg had a cry. Was it had a cry? It was. It was a bit sad because, you know, they know where I'd come from and I'd come back that year from a broken hip. So I trained really hard to get to be fit enough to do that. But, you know, on the flip side, it was only because I was part of a team that I would have even had that opportunity, you know. Mm -hmm. Like I wasn't the team leader, but it was our job to soften everyone up to have a go. And if things had gone a bit differently, it might have been my day. But yeah. How did it feel? I don't want to keep talking about negative things, but how, how did it feel when your career, when you decided to, to, to finish up? Um, oh, look, it's mixed feelings. There's a few weeks in your pyjamas. <laughs> yeah, right. Going, oh, what am I going to do with my life? Because it is your identity and you, yeah. uh, you know, being fit, being healthy, being able to race. But by then I was ready. I Look, to be honest, I did start too late. At 33, I'd had enough of chasing bike races around the world. And, mm. you know, it's... It's it is a bit you know no matter what it's a bit scary and it's a bit risky, you know you can do everything right and still have a crash and mm. it's be your fault. So um, and no, we wanted to have a family, but it was yeah the loss of identity is pretty hard because that is who you are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Now what's harder, being a professional bike rider or being the mother of four boys? I think being the mother of four boys is. <laughs> Who's stricter? Are you stricter or is Greg stricter? Um, I'm a bit more consistent. Greg's like ignore, 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 explode. 
<laughs> but I spend, uh, look, you know, we've made, as a couple, we've made a lot of sacrifices for his business. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I came back to Australia pregnant and he's um, chased his business from then. So I've not uh, done any paid work. So I've I've been the constant in the boy's life. So I've had to put up with him a lot longer, yeah, a lot more. Yeah. You know, yeah. he's been ridiculously busy. Uh, yeah, no, much harder to bring up four boys and boys as well. Like, yeah. no idea. So, you had what, any idea do, they were do you have a small? Do you have a small trophy room where you keep some of your, Not being silly, do you have any like souvenirs or like you keep a box of your stuff and your old kit? Yeah, I do. I've got Good. some of that storage at the moment because we're moving. But I do have this this trophy that I won for Chrono Champenois, which is the time trial, yeah. and it's an enormous trophy, and yeah. it's. And it's even we didn't pack it away, so it sits on the shelf. And my son's under nine soccer team. The coach is the coach is actually the coach's wife is Stephen Hodge's sister. Oh right. So wow. my awesome. two of my sons are friends with um, Stephen Hodge's nephews. Oh, so that's they, awesome. He's a lovely guy. Super he's lovely. Guy. Gorgeous. And his sister is even more gorgeous. And so they play soccer together. And normally oh. BJ, who's um, Stephen's brother-in-law, gets Stephen to bring a trophy. For the best on ground for the week and he goes well since we've got another you know talented athlete you can bring a trophy and this was the only trophy i had at home and seriously it weighs 12 kilos and so oh. every week they'd have to bring it on and the kids are like holding it up like this for their best on ground so it's quite sweet and it's have awesome. you encouraged your boys to get into cycling or not i i encourage them to mountain bike but I don't think you send your kids on the road because I can send my my 13-year-old is quite keen in um, when he's got time. He and a mate just go and do, oh, they probably only do 10 or 12 Ks at Bruce Ridge yeah. down the road, but um, he'll do that regularly and it's more social and they have fun. And during COVID, we had a great time doing it as a family because it wasn't much, you know, much so much else that you could do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but... Yeah, look, I just think it's a hard life being a professional cyclist. Would you say it's a lot easier now, though? Definitely for, yeah, look, definitely for women. I yeah. think for men, uh, look, the life around it, but the racing is still hard. You it's know. mental. Yeah, it is. Every day you have to bring yourself up. Those, it like, it, it just is the hardest sport. Not necessarily, I mean, the training's hard, but rowers do as much training as we do, but their racing is nothing like it. Mm, mm. Yeah. So you had a few injuries over the time. Do you still do you feel those in your body now in terms of either your collarbones or any other part of your body where you've kept those sort of I'm, aches and pains? Or I have constant niggles, but I can. Right. Think I ran a my one and only marathon two years ago, so I can uh, time still move. Sorry, oh, I did the Queenstown. It was a it was trail a three twenty. That's so pretty good. Guys, you can't argue with that. That's gold. Um, and my, my final question for the evening is, um, do you ever catch yourself, you know, in the middle of your day or do you dream about that chrono time trial win or do you ever just flash back and go, I had a completely whole other life. Did you ever have those moments or in your dreams or anything? Yeah, look, a little bit. When, you know, the fifth the fifth time you get woken up at night by a child. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, I wish I was a cyclist again. <laughs> yeah. No. And look, do you was, do your kids really know what you achieved? Oh, not really. No. no. Oh, they have a go. So I, you know, like obviously they love the trophy, and also I had to do, and we were talking about this the other night with Liv, is how the AIS women's funding was um, through research grants. So we were used as guinea pigs. Oh right. And in year six at my son's school, they do a project on um, data and and can the human get how far how much faster can the human get? And so the teacher, one of the teachers, invited me in to have a chat to the class. Awesome. And you know it was about you know my a bit about my racing, but a lot about the ex experiments that were that we took part in, the research projects that we took part in uh, in the AIS. So. Yeah. Proud moment, I'd say. Yeah, good stuff. So it's fun, but it feels it is a lifetime ago. I mean, God, there's four children in between the last time I raced and now. Wow. 
and two of them you, on me. <laughs> your four greatest achievements, I would suggest. Oh, all five, because there's Greg as well. Do you have five kids? My wife says she has four kids, and I'm I the fourth four, one. So four, 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 and a big ugly one. Yeah. Five. <laughs> <laughs> He's an attractive <laughs> man. I've still got right? memories of him with the, with the red flowing hair. Yeah, not so much anymore. <laughs> but look, Paul, have you got anything you wanted to close out on? Um, look, I'd encourage Margaret, your kids, to watch you tonight. I think it's been an absolute pleasure. Paul, have you got anything you wanted to say before we close out? No, look, I, I wanted to say, again, at the start, you know, thank you so much for your time. It's been great to hear your, your story. You've had a huge, hugely successful career and, and obviously been a really good person and, and really good friends with people that you've ridden with, you know. I had a few texts before from an individual in Newcastle who, who described you as a lovely person, but also tough as nails. And, you know, that, that's a real credit to you. And uh, hats off. And thank you for sharing mm. your, your story with us tonight. So, yeah, cheers. Thanks for your time and lovely to chat with you guys. Yeah, and likewise from me, Margaret. Um, one thing that came through for me and from absolutely all of our guests is how humble Mm. Um, every time we ask you a question, you kept trying to divert it off to someone else. And and we have that um, in our guests. They're all just so incredibly humble. And it's just a lovely experience for us to be able to sit down and tell your story and share it to, to all our viewers. So thank you, thank you, thank you. My pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks See a lot. lot. Thank Cheers. you.